didn't know you were going to be so good so fast. No, not a problem. Um, <laughs> my name is Fred Swanson. I've been doing this for 30 years, but I've been at West for 23 years. And prior to that, I uh, was a year at East High School. So I've been in Madison a good long time. Um, and six years around the state doing supportive development, job development, and things of that nature um, on the West Coast and in other places in Wisconsin. My entire gig at West is, as a special educator, finding placements for my students and work that is meaningful and carries on and is um, going to stand the test of time. Employers continue to need. We're building in efficiencies within their businesses, and the kids can stay there as long as they're cutting the mustard like any other employee and the, um, it's of, uh, of enough interest that, uh, for them at that level to be able to continue. So, I'm just not making taxpayers, okay? In a crass, really obvious way of saying it, college leads to work for some folks, tech school for other folks, military for some folks, high school, my program for this population of folks with disabilities. Uh, it's all out trying to listen to what kids want to do when they're working and saying, hey, I'd really like to work there, I'd really like to work there. And then going and helping them follow those, those dreams and aspirations. Chelsea and Tiffany have been here for um, every single day that they've been open. They're in their late 20s now. Were West High School students when they started. Um, another young man, Ariel, this is one of the, I'm teaching a class at Edgewood about developing jobs. Um, and Tom is one of my students. And there's a couple more folks that are coming in, Jonathan and Tammy, so they're just gonna kind of sit and listen to me talk like I know what I'm talking about. Um, so that, and, and the Great Dane has been an amazing employer. And Advanced Employment's had a number of the Great Danes. And we do the exact same type of work. It's just that my population is kids that are, you know, high school age. And by federal law, my kids can stay till age 21, three years after everybody else graduates, provided that I do the service, which is to place them on, on jobs. Okay. Um, one of the things that we, we hang our hat on and we feel that we're very good at is to come in and look at businesses and to be able to say um, to business owners and uh, managers and supervisors, where can we build efficiencies? How can we figure out what are some of the things that aren't necessarily an entire job description, but can then be pieced out or parceled out, spun into a different job description, just then freeing up somebody to do all the other higher order tasks that they may have gone to college for, that they may have had specific training or specialized training on. Um, it's the classic example of walking into an embroidery shop in South Madison, looking at a list on the wall which was you know, every single Friday for the next three months and realizing that there's people's names behind it and asking the supervisor, this is the people that are cleaning, correct? On Friday, the break room, how much does Brock make? It Brock's my $40,000 a year sales. Do you know Brock cleaning on Friday afternoon? Do you know Brock spending three hours detailing in the kitchen? Or can we talk about that and all the other tasks that I've seen as I've walked through here? <laughs> you know, how can we keep Brock on the phone selling stuff? So that's what I do. I'm coming in and I'm trying to figure out, Jennifer does the same exact thing. We'll talk to you a little bit about um, how we mesh and marry, but that's kind of a quick, if an elevator were going up to the top of the Sears Tower, that's my elevator pitch, okay? All right, so that's what I do. Have you talked yet? Typically, he'll say in the students could stay mm -hmm. in school with his program until they're 21. Once they exit that program, they come into an adult vocational agency, which is what advanced employment is. And we just really continue the good work that the high schools do. So we will take over job coaching in the different sites. And part of it too is just getting to learn our clients and what their abilities are. So as they grow and learn more and have more experiences in life, maybe their passions change and what they want to do for a job changes and their skills change. They get more developed and so we may end up finding another job for them, you know, that really incorporates the new skills and new passions. So we do a lot of job development in that sense too. Um, and one big thing we do is we always talk about how we want to work ourselves out of a job. <laughs> so help the clients be as independent as they possibly can be with the job and us just being there for support and just minimize our support as much as possible because our clients take such pride in what they do. They love coming to work. And so we really want them to be proud of who they are as employees. And so we really try to develop that too. So, so how did the two of you get connected? Um, you know, Fred, did you start the program in Madison West? And then how did you get connected to Jennifer? So I can tell you a little bit about my, my history is really brief. I come out of sales. Okay, I can do this work. What I do when I develop jobs, it's exactly like sales. Okay, there's nothing different. It's just that I have a service that I'm selling. Okay, instead of a product or a commodity. 
Um, and the service is this amazingly deep in this community because we're disproportionate with folks with disabilities because of the university and the research done here. A very deep pool of talent, okay, that we can bring to employers to say, this is who we've got. This is how we can help solve needs. So I came out of sales being a dis disaffected salesman and I came back in through the teaching model and then Taylor made a program at West High School that um, brought kids with significant disabilities back to that high school for the first time ever. Um, I refer to West. Did anybody, anybody go to West? Anybody, anybody from Madison that went to a different high school? Okay, then, um, okay excellent. So maybe, okay, maybe people understand the flavor of West High School. I refer to West High School as the Mid-City School for the Terminally Important. Okay, and we have this kind of, that's us. Look at us. And uh, uh, so it's, it's that kind of, and we did not allow kids to go to their neighborhood high school if they had a significant disability. That was verboten because that was the high school where kids went to go to college. Why would those kids come to that school? Okay, so we started a program that brought those kids in, and now we're one of the most successful high schools. If you start to look at outcomes that are measurable, and certainly work is measurable. Okay, um, we can track the number of hours our kids are working. We can track how long they stay on their job. We can track the income that they're making. So I started it, and advanced employment because of the way. Um, if you've been around Madison long enough, and you remember um, County Executive Rick Phelps. He looked at a problem that was in human services that was countywide that we were all paying for as taxpayers, and he figured out a way brilliantly to look at unemployment for folks with disabilities in Dane County. And he said, you know what, if the high school spends all this money, and we as uh, taxpayers spend all this money funding education, and those guys get these kids jobs, but then they have to go on a wait list for two or three years, they've lost those jobs, the employers lost that talent pool. Um, Advanced employment and agencies of that, uh, of that kind aren't even involved yet because kids can't go right into services. Rick Phelps said, you know what, if we braid funding together across three different areas, and Fred does his job, as an example, and gets paid work, then they'll circumvent that wait list and go right to a place like advanced employment, okay? It's called the continuity of service clause. What that did then was it didn't affect parents who then had to take time off their own work or quit their jobs, okay? So that helped them. Kids weren't languishing at home anymore as young adults. They stayed at their jobs. That's how we are now connected by this continuity of service clause that is triad in funding with the uh, state money coming from the Division of Oak Rehab. The DPI funding coming in this, coming in this case from the Madison School District, okay? And then Dane County Human Services coming in from this. And what we're saying is, if we get all these people together, we can share the pot instead of looking at the damages which two or three years after somebody's unemployed, the amount of money that you have to spend to get them reemployed is exponentially more than if you would have kept them employed and continued to do what Jennifer says, which is build independence. So that's how we're connected. 23 years at West, school's been around 70 plus years, but for 50 of them, kids with disabilities didn't go Do they use your program as a pilot program at all in other schools? You would think. Yeah, you would <laughs> think. <laughs> One would cross fingers. One would be like Jesse Jackson and say, keep hope alive. Um, but the way we do it at West, and one of the reasons I think that we're really successful is we look exactly like advanced employment. We don't look like a school program. So we don't have a classroom. We're fully included, fully integrated, and we have an office. So we look like an adult program, or we look like a college office, okay, where you come in and see your instructors if you need help after class, okay? So our kids are used to being independent. We're supporting them in regular ed classes between the time they're freshmen and seniors. And then at the same time, they're seeing all these other older kids go out to work and the expectations of this is what we do here, of work. But because we do it year round, okay? I work summers, I'm on the clock right now, I'm just teaching here, but my staff is all working. Um, we work winter break and spring break. We work and are outstanding at bus stops when it's 30 below, okay, with kids. And we're doing the work that these guys are doing and we're making it look, our, our systemic change for our kids is, is low. Other schools still have a rooms and places for kids to go that are segregated by and large. We're working in Madison towards making the other three look, okay? My constant comment to my, my supervisors is, if you're in the world of business and you're in sales and there's a pod of 12 people doing your sales and there's a group over here of four that are out achieving these other groups of four, how long does it take before these other groups of four have to do it the way these guys are doing? You don't let these two continue to, to not achieve. You figure out how to let them achieve. We haven't done that in Madison, okay? And I'm here to tell you that we're trying to do that, okay? We're trying desperately to do that. 
trying to send my student teachers to the other schools to get hired, okay, to start looking at, we're one of the few things that is non-testing but outcome-based in the world of education, and it's completely measured. So the beauty is that you would hope that it would look the way it looks at West, natural, ever, but it's not the case. It takes a little bit of money. It's an expenditure, okay? They're paying for my time in the summer, okay? And people at my job don't expect to have summers off, okay? So my world just looks like anybody else in the business world. I get a week off if I want, okay? And manager will take it. But otherwise, that's, <laughs> that's what I do. Okay, it's not like I got three months off or anything else. But I also came from the world of your own schools. You know, Paul, that you're not in your own schools nationwide. Okay, we're not an agrarian community, certainly not in Madison. There's not a kid at West that stays home to take in the crops. Uh, I'm just curious, how do you guys get employers engaged? What, what, what kinds of mechanisms do you use, or how do you get them engaged? I think a lot of it for me is just going out and having that conversation. Like Fred was saying, we go and find the need that the employer has. We try, there's been a shift recently where before in our field, we're very people minded and we're like, being like, this is a good thing to do. Please hire a person. And now we're more business minded where, how can we help you meet your needs? your bottom line and help with that. So we talk to the businesses and see what their needs are. For example, at a retail store, the manager, this seems so minor, but all he wanted was for the rails that the pools hang on to be waxed. His staff never had time to get to it, but it helped customers shop, it made it easier for them. They found more stuff that they liked because it was easier for them to shop, so they bought more stuff. So it produce more money for the store. And so he hired a client to come in and wax the rails because that was one thing that he just did not have time for his staff to do that he really wanted to have done and help the store out because it produced more money. So in that conversation just started by, hey, what needs do you have? What do you feel like you just don't have time to get done? And it started from there. So that is just a small example, but it's example that happens over and over and over again. And, so. and we're constantly looking. It's one. It's hard because people in education, okay, in Jennifer's world it might be a little different because they can kind of tailor make their hiring to who they want to kind of target, you know, to fill these positions. In schools you have to be licensed. And there's very few people that go into teaching to sell anything, okay? I just happen to be a failed salesperson, a failed theater guy, okay? So I can stand in front of a group and talk very comfortably. But at the same time, it's all the same sales principles. It's all about networking. It's all about spider webbing your people. Who do you know? It's about being a present. It's very much about relationships and trust and making sure that I can have a face-to-face -face with you. The joke in my house, my wife will say, okay, when you place that job, how much did that cost us? Because I've joined health clubs, <laughs> multiple health clubs, <laughs> okay? And we all know how typical people, how typically people go to health clubs. Um, I've spent a lot of money on lunches and dinners in restaurants. I've bought clothes I don't need, okay? And it's because I want to be there and I want to look and I want to get a lens around this business. Classic example of not selling anybody short is being able to, as a business person, walk into a business and say, I bet that's a need. At least I'm going to ask, and if it's not, then I know it's not. But many times, after doing this for so many years, you can look and say, oh wait, I'm at the Capital Brewery. That is a $750,000 kegging and filling machine that is automated. I bet one of our guys can run it, and he does, okay? $750,000 machine from Germany. It's totally automated, easy to do, but somebody has to run it, and you don't need two people to do it, but you kind of need one and a half, so they hired my guy to do that. So that's what I'm looking for when I'm in there. The Great Dane, one of the things that we talk about here continually at all the Great Danes, it's like any restaurant anywhere in the country. If you've ever served, you make two something an hour, and you live off tips. But when you come in to set the restaurant up at eight in the morning, you make two something an hour. Very few people want to come in and wipe down the table, put silver on it, put all this stuff together for $2.30 an hour, okay? That is not motivating. Plus, if you know anything about tips, chances are your checks many times are zero, okay? Because your tips are quarter. So you might come in and not get paid at all to do this. So we said in Madison, you can now target your college age employees and tell them they can take an eight o'clock, a nine o'clock, and sometimes a 10 o'clock class because there's somebody else coming in and doing this work. And then they can actually do the side work. Today, if you notice, they're using Murphy's Oil Soap because it's Tuesday and they're soaping all of the rails and all of the, um, uh, anything that's worth. Yes? I have a question. Are your clients paid? And likewise, do the students receive school credit? Mm -hmm. Or what kind of compensation? Mine is interesting because um, my kids don't have to, but I'm a firm believer that if, um, you're paying somebody else to do the work, 
my students should be paid. If it's work that somebody else is doing as a volunteer, then I can use it as a job experience or a work experience for kids to build skills, okay? But I could, because it's a work experience program, much like DECA or OSA or any of the other high school programs, my kids get high school credit to graduate, okay? Some kids will go through core credits, my kids will go through what's called an IEP, okay? Their education plan that's tailored to them, and they get credits to be able to do that. So by law, I could technically not. But at the same time, if I can sell, I should be able to sell a wage for somebody. So the answer is yes. And then for Jennifer, I'm sending her kids, okay, that are already on somebody's payroll. And our expectation is that our clients are treated like every other employee at the place. So they're on the payroll, they get invited to the picnics, and we just want them to be included and to build those relationships. I mean, a regular eval scale that anybody else gets. We want our guys being reviewed if it's every three months in your probationary period, get reviewed after three. If it's annualized after that, if it's twice a year, we want to be on that page. We want to be on that same churning mechanism. Please don't forget our guys, okay? Just because they're still doing the same tasks or maybe doing the same tasks after two or three years. So. Um, I just have a question about the demographics between your students and then your organization. Um, just to get a better picture of just what the we're type about. Yeah. So, Thank so you. I'll, I'll give you less demographics, yeah. but they're very, very similar to any other high school, particularly in Madison. Um, and then we'll talk about the percentage of my kids that go to Jennifer, because not all my kids go. So we've got 60 kids at West, about 30 are in the freshman to senior group and are included in regular classes. Okay? So it's a fully inclusive model where they're being taught by regular ed teachers and supported, okay, as independently as possible by a staff person from special ed in a regular ed class, 30 kids. The 30 kids that are with me will run the gamut from, you can walk down the street, pass an individual in the mall, and visually assume that individual has a disability. They could be in a wheelchair, they could be using augmentative communication, okay? They could be physically challenged, you can, you can, you can see that, okay? So, and then in that same group are folks with a developmental, a developmental disability of some sort, okay? Autism falls under that. Um, Down syndrome, cognitive disabilities fall underneath that big umbrella of a developmental disability. It's folks that have lower, lower cognition, okay? So that group, and then I serve kids all the way down to folks that can gain a two-year certificate at MATC, okay? And are fully capable of doing that. And at the same time, might be extremely needy at work. But because they have high-functioning autism might be an example there, okay? And because we're so skewed in the world of autism and medicine because of research and university, I joke that we used to call people with autism, we used to call them college professors and engineers, okay? <laughs> now everybody has autism, okay? And we're over-diagnosing it, okay? And we're gonna find out later that we've over-diagnosed, but people are searching for a label, okay? We did this with learning disabilities back in the 70s. But there's a population down here that I work with that has support needs, Maybe less so in an academic environment because they're able to function there cognitively because they're not depressed on an IQ score, but socially they're more clipped and need more things there in a social environment, which is a typical broad brush painting of somebody with high functioning autism. So my world is a bigger spectrum. This group over here that has long-term support needs for the rest of their life at work or residentially, that's who goes to Jennifer's group. They have to qualify, there's an entire screening process that Dane County does. This chunk of my kids will then be served by an agency like Jennifer's vocational. Does that help? Yep. Mine is skewed probably 60, 40, boys, girls. I would bet yours is similar. Yeah. What about your staff? My staff, um, we have three teachers, well we have two teachers, and then about 10 assistants. Okay, and they're um, very similar. Our assistants, called special ed assistants, or SEAs, are similar to job coaches, okay, in the adult world. In the adult world, a case manager might be very similar to a teacher slash case manager, which is what I do. So Jennifer and I are very similar in title, okay, and responsibilities across the day, or the week. And our job coaches and our special ed assistants, okay, are kind of the boots on the ground even though both Jennifer and I spend the majority of our week in direct service contact with our students or clients. Can you give some examples, some more examples mm -hmm. of the employers? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, I think one of your classic example is, um, you know, health club. 
There's nothing that inspires more confidence in a health club than seeing somebody clean while you're working out. That is not a tough sell. It has been a tougher sell in Madison because many of the health clubs are owned um, by larger organizations. So it's tough to break in. And if you're a franchisee, it's not always that I can talk to you. It's not always that you have complete and utter control over your labor and everything else. So I understand that. But it, it's, that's a classic example that inspires great confidence. We have students that work here. I have a student right now that works at the Institute of Discovery, the big massive building, former students who work and current students that work there. Um, the homage to Jamie, the stem cell researcher, the most powerful man on campus, the coolest building in the Midwest. And we set up the research lab. One of my guys sets up the research labs in one of the most high-powered buildings in the freaking country, which is awesome. And then they force these guys, I love the fact that they use the word force, they hired all these interdisciplinary research groups and they said, we'd like you to get together to talk about what you do and we're gonna force you to do it by having tea at three. So they all come together, all these research guys from different areas at three o'clock and they drink free coffee, play bananagrams and talk about what they were doing for the morning. So it's a really cool thing. Somebody's gotta make the coffee. Somebody's gonna make the tea and somebody puts out the snacks. Okay, so that's it. At that really cool building. Um, we are going to be at the Navatorium and the Surf and the Shell with a brand new program that's going to match up college kids with high school kids with disabilities that do all their laundry, okay, and clean the locker rooms and detail the wood floors in the racquetball courts and the gymnasiums. So we're doing that. Um, I mentioned a number of different restaurants. We have kids at Coiled Carpet that used to be a Coiled Carpet that are Jennifer's now that do some like clerical kinds of things. I've got a number of law firms where we're doing like clerical things, everything from date stamping mail to um, going to the post office and running to the safety deposit box and shredding but one law firm, big law firm, that has a conveyor belt shredder that got so much shredding. And we load handfuls of documents every day onto a conveyor belt shredder. And that's what we do. That's what I So I mean, that's kind of a decent flavor of it. It's in service, it's in retail, it's in manufacturing, what little bit there is in Madison. I would argue that the Capital Brewery is a manufacturing concern under that umbrella. They make a product. Um, and then in some kind of office white collar business kinds of environments. And then you've got probably other examples. Yeah, well, some of the ones that, you know, like your yeah. TDS or TT, that's a really cool one. The, the tower captioning guys? Oh, they clean. They're, okay. Yeah, okay. no, but um, one of the, we have very similar jobs. Um, like at an insurance company, we have a young lady who is blind and has autism. So she's pretty limited in what she can do, but she opens up their mail and she'll stamp and void checks. She'll hold letters collection letters that need to be sent out. And again, you were talking about the efficiency. The rest of the staff in her department, they're making phone calls to these people and trying to collect their money. So they don't have time to be sitting there holding 60, 70 letters a day and opening the mail and stamping checks. And so she really helps with the efficiency of that department. But one of the cool things we do at Advanced Employment is we support what we call micro enterprises. So say if we have a client that's very interested in a certain job and wants to create their own business, we support them with doing that. And we've been pretty successful. Right now we're supporting five different businesses and one is a shredding company. And so we contract with different businesses throughout the county and we go pick it up. We give them locked bins so everything remains confidential. And we collect it and this guy shreds. That's what he loves to do. So he was able to start his own company and he's so successful, he hires other people to shred in our office now. And it's just fantastic to see that. But so I, I think that's pretty cool is that we are developing these businesses so that people with disabilities can then hire other clients of ours and really grow and still get to do what they love doing. We have a guy that designs t-shirts. We have another guy that sells books online. We have a young lady that makes um, keychains and different bracelets and stuff. And then another guy that converts VHS to DVDs. And so it's all passions that they have and they're able to make money doing it now. So I think that's one of the coolest things that we develop is we look at what people want to do. If we can help them start their own business and make it be successful, we go for it. So. As a group, we started an entire theater troupe of folks with disabilities who are now paid as professional actors, who put on four shows a year. They used to put them on at the Bartell, and they're one of the cornerstones of the Bartell. Now they have their own black box theater. But then they also present at conferences, okay, for folks like you know us, okay, and they talk about their lives as individuals with disabilities and what it's like to be supported by guys like us, okay, and what that means to them and how they, you know, realize their dreams are in some cases not. So I mean, we we've touched a ton of different areas, okay, many of which are super non-traditional. 
professional acting is certainly one of those where you can say to somebody, you can be an actor. We have gigs in this town that you can do. It. People are paying for this part. Has technology and um, you know the fact that things are able to be a lot more automated now had a impact on your profession and finding um, work for? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're trying to find shredding jobs for individuals, you're already capitated. Okay, because it may take a big company to still have some shredding left. The school district would be one of those. That is a big organization that has a lot of paper still. There's a lot of shredding that goes on in the school district. Hospitals are converting. So we flip that job to scanning jobs, okay, which becomes you know, a digital imaging position. Okay, and that is a big thing now in our industry. Conversion from, from paper to computer records where it can all be digitally imaged. And there is a very rote task at the beginning of that that doesn't necessarily need to be sorted after it's been scanned, that goes to an automatic file and then some caseworker can click, 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 click and move it to wherever they want. Okay, and whoever needs to see these folders can have access. So that becomes a very routine kind of thing. Um, data entry and database stuff for a lot of our students, particularly high functioning folks with autism, can do all of that work, okay, with an amazing clarity. I watched, I, if you guys have a second, just jot down project search. If you ever Google project search, um, you'll see amazing things that are going on in large corporations nationwide. Um, there's hundreds of project search models and they're business internships that started in hospitals because hospitals are like a town, okay? They have all these different things. And we took within project search a couple of tours around the country and looked at some of these high functioning jobs in insurance and in hospitals and said, how are they taking these files off? And many files are still numeric, okay? Where you go in and they're not alpha. And we're watching folks with autism who are noticing errors to the eighth digit because they're looking at it and it doesn't match up with something on the paper. So they couldn't pull it. And they're taking it to their boss going, there's not another person without a disability that's ever caught errors in this stripping job in this massive insurance company. So our kids, not only are they big and our adults, not only are they big talent here, they have some pretty wild spikes in certain areas where they can fill in niches that might not be a 10, a 10 year job, you know, stripping files and conversion, but today it's huge, and digital imaging is huge today, and then it'll be something else in 10 years. And we'll figure it out in 10 years what the next thing is. So that leads me to a question is, what kind of training do you guys provide? Do you guys do on-the-job training? Do you provide skills training in the schools or through your program? Um, or is it mostly on the job? Well, ours, I mean, we, because we're in high school, we're in a much more enviable position, I think, than an adult agency. Okay, we've got a lot of things already easier by its very nature. If I go into a business, I'm probably going to get somebody to talk to me if I stay in from the local high school. It might be harder for Jennifer to go in because people might not recognize what advanced employment is by its very name. Okay, so I've already got a door open. I've also got kids. Okay, kids are easier than an adult that's 40 or 50 years old to place. Inherently easy. The other thing that we have is we have the ability to look and say, you know what? My jobs don't necessarily, between ages 17 and 21, have to be careers, per se, because they weren't careers for any of us when we were 18. I would hazard a guess that none of us, none of us, are doing what we're doing now that we were doing at age 18. There are days I wish I was, okay, but not every day. Um, but, so I get that ability to say work experiences. So my kids can do some things. They can volunteer at their own churches or synagogues, okay, and get some of those training and skill models. They can do a project search, kind of a year rotation in six or eight different areas of the hospital in a business internship rotational model. Um, the training that happens on the job is all specific to the work itself. And a lot of times the way to work is I'll come into you and an employer and say, you know, it's easiest for you to train me and my staff, and then I'll train my guys. I'm not trained in your work, you are. You're not trained in how to break information down to folks with disabilities, I am. So together we'll work together and I'll take you out of that whole training module that might take weeks sometimes, take up some of your staff person's time to do all that leading training. We can take that out your point and do that. And then you guys are doing training every time there's a new job, but mm -hmm. ongoing daily training as well. Yeah, we have a program called Vocational Skills and it takes place in our office and basically we teach vocational skills. So we may we have towels in there so people can practice holding towels. We have computer programs so they can practice typing and doing data entry work. And we also teach some life skills that is always helpful in any environment. So telling time and counting money and 
relating to people, how to talk with people. If we have someone who's really shy, we try to get them out there and talk to people a little bit more and have conversations. So we spend time, and it's a, maybe like a one job coach to two client ratio. So a lot of it's very specific and specialized to help them. And we can explore new skills and see if they do have the skills to do that. We think we could train them to do certain things. And it just gives us a space to not be in a work environment. Because we try really hard to place an individual in a job where they will be successful. So we are very mindful of making that perfect match between the client skills and the job that is required. And so we don't necessarily want to be testing out the waters to see if this client could do a job or not while that client's being paid. You know, we don't think that's fair to the employer. So that's where, in our vocational skills, we could try those skills and see if they have what it takes and explore new things. Maybe they love holding towel, but they've just never done it before. And we find out, hey, they could work in a hotel doing laundry. And so that's how we do a lot of our training. That's something that would be a huge benefit to employers, that you're, you know, like you said, taking them out of the training mix and you're providing them with an already trained employee. Mm -hmm. And then we're also doing out of you know, coverage with someone. And what I try to explain to employers at the same time is you're still the employer. So you still have all of those same employer responsibilities. And I don't want my kid to see my staff as the employer because we're not, I want my guy to be seeing this group of people, whether it's myself or one of my assistants, as that bridge. Okay? These are the people that assist me, but this is who I report to. This is who I'm responsible to. This is who looks at my work and evaluates what I do, just like any of us. We're the bridge for, in many cases, communication, okay, and feedback and that ongoing um, piece to be able to manage the day-to-day -day and the week-to-week. -week. But it's huge. It's a big selling point to be able to say, you can take the training piece off your, off your life. And if a job coach is present um, at the site all the time, then we also can assure the quality of work. You know, here, the ladies that work here are fantastic. They know their job, but there's a job coach here to make sure they're being timely and that they're going to finish all their tasks on time and correctly. And so that's one thing that employers really like, too, is they know that they are getting a quality worker and that their work is going to be up to par, you know, their standards. And help ensure that. So if you're an increase the level of awareness with employers, just, let's just say within Dane County, um, seems like a big portion of your work is doing that assessment of the opportunities for that employer where students and other adults can help. Just because a lot of these routine things that have been done for years have been done by paid staff and, and you just don't question what's been working. So that whole assessment piece, how do you bring that to the employer as to kind of cross that barrier where our employer may not have a need? Absolutely. And they may not even know they have a need. Right. Okay? And in many cases, it, I can be told as easily as yes. I can be told no as easily as yes. Okay? So I have no problem walking in your business and somebody saying, this is just not going to work today. That's fine. Okay? My last example is what I did this year. The interesting part about staying in this business for 23 years, two-thirds accounted for this class I'm teaching. Two-thirds of the jobs that my students got this year were phone calls to me, not phone calls I made. Okay? People saying, hey, we're working with this other offer. The best thing is, you know, law firm's a classic example because that happened like five years ago. A law firm, we started at one law firm and all of a sudden another law firm finds out that I'm at this law firm and then I'm calling this all, I'm doing all this with another law firm, blah, blah, blah. I walked through Amanti Art, which is also a um, art dealer as well as a frame shop that does uh, individual frame and art for high-end stuff, but then they do a lot of commodity art, which is the stuff that you'd see at Kohl's, the stuff that you'd see at Pier 1, okay, stuff that you'd buy off the shelf. Creighton art, okay, that's your commodity art. And they didn't realize that they had a need until I said, you know, I said, just let me walk through. And it's plant, okay? And it's manufacturing to a point, okay? But it's as much sales and service as it is anything else. I mean, they're manufacturing a frame out of molding, but that's about what they're manufacturing. But they're running two shifts. I'm walking through the plant, and I'm looking at what I'm seeing is it just jumps out of me after this much time, but the owner didn't even know he had an issue. And I said, who makes those? And what they were were those corners that go on the pictures when you move them, and they're cardboard, and they come flat, and somebody has to fold them. So then my next question was, how many shifts do you run? Because I'm seeing eight framers. They're like, well, we run two shifts. How often? Every day. Saturday included, Saturday included. So, oh, there's 16 guys making frames. How many corners do you need every single day? Oh, we need about 600. Who's making them now? Well, these guys stop. 
and then they make corners, and then they frame one more, and then they stop and make corners. I can help you with this. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's, 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 sometimes it's silly how easy it is. You know, and he said, really? I never thought of that. And then I said, and then who cleans your bathrooms? And who vacuums? And who details the front door? And then pretty soon it's, we're there. It's 25 hours a week for this room. And this one, one gal with um, some pretty significant needs is making 300 plus corners a day. She just started making 30. And she got the hanging room. It's like, boom. And all it took was putting gardening gloves on her to get better grip. Now she's making 300. That's awesome. And, and the, the cost savings on this guy for this job is, is big. Okay, because his, his production rates are up. Okay, the other one that was classic was there used to be a print shop, and there still is to a small level in the Department of Transportation. And merely by delivering done print, uh, print orders around that eight story building, it increased their efficiency, and people got their stuff quicker. They got stuff to him quicker. They got their projects done. Their meetings happened in a, in a, in a quicker succession. And their turnaround was amazing. They started to track how many more projects got started earlier and done on time because they're all project based. And they were able to say part of that was because of this efficiency in this one area along with these. So it's, it's being able to walk through. Jennifer and I can walk through a business and we can tell you a lot of times exactly what we think our guys can do. I can't go anywhere. I can't go shopping. I can't go out to eat without being like, ooh, someone could do that. They yep. could do that. They could do that. <laughs> like it's a curse almost. Yeah, I'm dangerous to drive a car with. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm constantly looking out the, uh, out the window and seeing what's new and who's new. And I, I will walk in and ask businesses that are new. If I can have a tour, I'll say I'm from high school, I'm really interested, I run a work experience, can I just get a tour? And that might lead to something, but it might not, but it gives me ideas about cross-purposing within that industry many, many times. And so you guys are kind of your own salespeople. Totally. totally. And it helps, when, it helps a lot when you want to do it. It helps a lot when you are trained to do it and you come to the world from sales. It's really a struggle if you're a teacher trying to do it with no training whatsoever. Hard if you're a social worker that didn't want to go out and try to sell because selling is it's, it's tough business. Okay, I mean it's you have to be able to get to a point of being bulletproof where stuff just rolls off your back. It's okay. It doesn't define me if I don't doesn't say who I am as a person if I don't get that job. Okay, but I can walk through your business and tell you exactly what so Jennifer can tell you now how we can help. How how much of that issues why this very good and worthwhile program is not everywhere in Dane County? Well, I can tell you some numbers that I think are fairly jaw-dropping. There's over 600 businesses in Dane County that hire somebody with a disability, and our economic impact is north of 1.2 million on wages. Okay, so there are a ton, okay? But the great part about it is Madison's a different, one of the things I'm doing at Edgewood is I'm teaching folks that do what Jennifer and I do for a living from across the state. And not everywhere's Madison. Not everywhere's even Milwaukee. And it has less to do with urban than it has to do with attitude. Okay, we're very open, willing to try, creative, okay, as a group, as a culture in Dane County, more so than other pockets of the state. So I can walk in and very rarely do I get any, oh my gosh, I can't imagine what they could do here. Or what would somebody with that disability do? Or just kind of what we used to think people thought of us. That doesn't happen hardly any, anymore. But the great thing is you can start to spider web industries. For one, there's not a group up in the city that doesn't have somebody with a disability at it, because those are my people. <laughs> those are who I know. There's not a winemaker that's, you know. So, um, so that's, that's an industry that I've exploited. Um, there's very few law firms of any size that don't have somebody with a disability working in them, because, you know, it's one thing to tell this business that they're doing great, but suddenly the word gets out, hey, you know, Colin Weston Pines and Black hired somebody. Well, then pretty soon Stafford Rosen was there or something. And pretty soon, you know, Michael Best and Friedrich's got something. Okay, those are all three of our job sites. Okay. Pretty soon, people are going, hold on, who's doing that for you? And office managers are talking across each other, saying, well, I do that. They got somebody that I can. Okay, so I'll get phone calls like that. Jennifer will get phone calls like that. And you, tar you target those, you know, you target your markets like anything in sales. Okay, I know that we've got folks that can do this. We're already successful at this kind of a business, so let's go to another one of those businesses. So, but people in Dane County, I think, by and large, are super recent. Yeah, very much so. And once we have someone placed in a job, um, maybe it expands to another one. They like us so much and appreciate what mm -hmm. we're doing so much. They're like, oh, well, I have this job now that you could, do you have someone for this? And so, yeah, it really is just networking and making sure that you're representing what we do really well. I've had people tell me that 
I seemed so excited about what I was doing that they wanted to hear more. And then that led them to ideas of like, oh, yeah, we can use this person and stuff. So like you said, I mean, we really enjoy what we do. We believe in what we do or else we probably wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> so. yeah, it's, it's really hard. Um, I can see through a lot of people that are what I call up with people people, okay? We're all just signing Rosie and, and smile a lot and just, but then there's like, it's a veneer. They don't really buy it. Um, I think there's a lot of backstories to a lot of us that do this work about why we do it, okay? And why we believe in it so much. I would believe less in selling cheese. I like cheese. <laughs> but I would believe less in that than I do in this service of people that I've got. And it's, this is a very rare hair color in this industry. There's not a lot of us that age into it. Um, there's a lot of people that go off and do other things, mostly due to what is what I would call perceived failure um, after a short period of time in the job. It's one of the reasons we're holding what I'm calling a job developer boot camp at, at Edgewood College to train folks to become bulletproof, um, to spread the good word and do it you know, from a place that's really you know, a good place and a place for belief. So, so yeah, I think we can get to a place like that. I mean, the great part is that I get to go and tell stories about something I believe in and I think that shows. Okay, I think I come across that way instead of just this cheerleader, which is kind of like the Wizard of Oz, you pull across my curtain, and like that. really, there's no depth to what I'm talking about. What are some reasons that businesses have said no, or maybe would be hesitant, or something like that? I think a lot of times, initially, years ago, it was liability. Okay, people are concerned about liability. Uh, people are concerned about, um, perceptions or perceived things that might happen, okay, but don't, okay. Um, the school district takes care of that in one way. We sign a contract with a business and it covers us in three years of liability. It's the exact same contract that is a perceived contract if you're a football player or a theater kid that's going and doing a drama production. Because my kids are in the program, it doesn't matter when they are, whether it's school day or Saturday, they're covered under three areas of liability. One is health and safety. Okay, the one and the other one is if they filch something, if they take something that's not theirs, they don't pay for it. And then if they were to break it, okay? So school district lawyers have come up with a contract that serves as a secondary, certainly not a primary policy for a business, but it serves as a little bit of comfort to say, you know what? Okay, I can relax my shoulders a little bit. I've used that once in 23 years. It was at an embroidery shop where one of my guys thought he was gonna do a great service I see a lot too um, that oh you have to do everything you know and they're not willing to have that conversation about how you, know, you can help make them more efficient and that just is learning more about the company and the different jobs and helping them see that maybe there is a need that can be what we call like being carved out so very specialized position and so I hear that but again you just have to learn more about the company and how it operates and get around that. So. I think we scare people. Okay, because we use words that people that mean stuff to us that don't mean anything in business, like job coach. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Job coach. Okay, job carding. What does that mean? What does this mean? What does that mean? And we try to say, okay, we're looking for targeted tasks. Okay, we're looking for efficiencies. We're looking for ways to free people up to do higher order things. We're trying to look at stuff that you're currently not getting done, but you'd like to get done. Again, targeted tasks. That's what we're doing. We're trying to figure out what those are to free people up. So, is there a recruitment arm? in Dane County that goes out and, and tries to bring people into the, the, the funnel or the pipeline to you. Um, so you don't have to do the, the excessive outreach at all times mm -hmm. and you can do the assessment based on you know these, these leads that come in from employers who have interest. Is, or are you just doing it from from an idea and such? I think this would be a great group to provide that service. Well, I'm just <laughs> No, there's no group that does it. I'm a one-man gang in my room. Yeah. Okay. And Looking at your job the same as you would mm -hmm. someone else's job, mm -hmm. is there a ways that we there can are make ways. your job more There efficient? are ways. Okay, absolutely. There are ways and there are cooperative efforts that certainly could be addressed. Um, we've tried numerous times, okay? We're never at the top of anybody's priority list, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce or Thrive or anybody like that that's manufacturers and commerce, anybody. You know, we're never at the top of a priority list to do that. We're always, yeah, that'd be great if we had time, group. Um, so we need to target that somehow. I'm not quite sure how to do that. Um, at the same time, I also don't have that time to, I have time to help somebody help do that, um, but I don't have the time to do that and then bring it to somebody because I don't have those connections. I know a lot of people, but I don't know everybody. Right. So. I just want to make sure we got them while they're still yeah. here. So let them know they can come in. Ladies. <laughs> how are you? 
So Tiffany and Chelsea were two of my former students, okay? Um, like most of my former students, they got nicknames, okay? That's one thing that high school kids always get, <laughs> but kids with disabilities don't get, particularly boys. It's one of the things that, you know, you say it and it's like, it's so simple. I know that most of us as men can tell you what our nicknames were, but Chelsea has been referred to forever by me as Dr. Lucas. Okay. <laughs> and there's a really good story that I will not embarrass her with. And Tiffany is Tiggs. Okay? And that's how we know each other. And I won't force adult agencies <laughs> to use my nickname. But it's one of the normalizing things that we try to do. Okay, to make it seem like, you know, everybody's in high school, they got seven names. Right? So where are you guys going after this? Lunch. After lunch, we're going to Big Ten. Big Ten? Big Ten pub? With Kimi. Uh-huh. What do you do at Big Ten? Kimi. Kimi in the office. <laughs> Kimi is the boss of the Big Ten. So, what do you guys do at Big Ten? Cleaning windows. You're doing the windows? You're cleaning the windows? Bathrooms. Bathrooms? Dr. Lucas, what are you doing? Men's. Men's bathroom, okay. <laughs> All right. So, you're stuck in men's, takes us still in women's. All right. Excellent. And then you're also setting the place up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't know if Jennifer did I ever tell you the story about how we ended up at Big Ten. No. Okay. I haven't heard this is a great story because it's very illustrative. Um, uh, uh, Kelly at the Big Ten, the owner, Kelly Jordan, Jordan's Big Ten, book, is um, on a bunch of different um, social media sites. Okay. And she gets feedback through computer visits when people um, go on back in. And one of them is. Um, a Hilton Honors kind of thing, okay? And she came back and she said, some of my, when I went in to talk to her, because that's where I took my staff one Friday, um, purposefully, and uh, seated the place with a lot of free drinks for my people to get them there. And she saw me spending money in the place and she said, what do you do? I said, this is what I do. So when I came back in the next time, I made an appointment, she said, my feedback is showing me that I could have this place become cleaner and more detailed. So right there, we were able to fill a need. So she's coming to us with a need we're able to immediately address that need and go forward. And now you guys have been working there for how many years? Seven, eight, nine, it's a long time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also, tomorrow, you're gonna go to Coyle? Oh, yes. Okay. And takes Africa, where do you go Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoons? Bowling. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So, other questions? The question's for the ladies. How many places do you guys work? How many different places do you go? Where are all your jobs? What? What jobs do you have? Three. Which are they? Great day. Yeah. Coil. Coil carpet. Out on the belt line. Big Ten. Big Ten Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> Except for no coil. Except for no coil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and coil. Yeah. With me and James and Chad. Yeah. And coil is a classic example of somebody that didn't know that they had needs. I was on a board of directors. He looked at me and said, I work at coil. I'm the same board of directors. Can't you come over and tell me what I need to do? And we were able to target live industry and white clerical kinds of things and then stuff down in the warehouse because they've got some warehouse needs as well. And then some retail fun. The girls are in Chelsea knows in the retail yeah. part of it as well. Yeah. And one thing, I mean, they've been at their jobs for a long time, so that's a big thing for employers too, especially in like a restaurant business or retail is, there can be a lot of turnover, but they also like your jobs, right? You like going, so. How many hours do you guys work a week? Tip probably 20 to 30. Yeah, about 19-ish, yeah. And then the good it would be a little bit more. Probably close to 30. What's your favorite job? Here. <laughs> <laughs> and tonight when I bring 20 people to have dinner at the Big Ten Pub, it's going to be Big Ten. <laughs> 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 Crazy by his own. My birthday is one month. This way. What? This is coming. <laughs> yeah. Are you having a party here? No. no. Where's it going to be? It'll be in Union. The Union. 
Coming to the party? And we're and we. Okay, and we're the great part about being connected, my boss loves this, okay? The school district isn't smart enough to get out of a government cell phone plan, okay? So we overspend for our cell phones, which is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. But having a 23 year old job and having kids that still stay connected and you still have your same phone number, and they all have it in their phones, <laughs> I get invited to stuff like this. Chelsea remembers everybody's birthday. She knows the staff, my staff's birthday. And then I walk in here one day with a student who we're delivering Isthmuses on Thursday, and she's got a birthday card for me, and of course it's written 51 all over it. Okay? <laughs> inside, outside, there's stickers with 51 all over it. So not only does she know my birthday, she knows all over it. Remember, <laughs> I sent you a picture for that in the, in, the, in the fashion show. You did. You sent me a picture from you in the fashion show, too. Okay, there's a big fashion show that goes on in the community for folks with disabilities. And there's 80, 90 folks that do the runway. Yeah, there's it's a, a huge lot, number. Yeah. Okay, the parents are out there and they're business workers. And, and when do folks with, you know, with disabilities get a chance to actually be in a fashion show? Okay. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. okay. Get the hair done, get the makeup done for the parents, get to pick clothes up from different stores. It's super cool. Get to wear 200 hour jeans. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good person. That's not <laughs> a bad night. That's not a bad night. There's snacks. That's awesome. Other questions? I would love to figure out a way for Jennifer and I to be connected to you folks. Do you guys have any ideas about, because I'm looking at the Alliance, I'm looking at Foley, Lardner, um, another LLP. Oh, so not Quarles and Brady, yeah. okay? I have a former uh, lawyer friend, not former so, friend. Former lawyer from Madison that worked there. What do you guys do to promote it? To promote, do you do any like social media initiatives to to get the word out? I speak whenever I can at whatever I can. Okay, and I know Jennifer does the exact same thing. So when I called up Jennifer after Emily from the Great Dane said that y'all were coming in, mm -hmm. immediately we're of the same mind. Okay, so we'll talk to any group of that. Ilk. I will talk at any church or synagogue in their adult education, okay? That's a classic example of something I do all the time. I will talk to business groups for whatever, you know, umbrella, it might be Kiwanis. That's a big thing in smaller towns, okay, to stay connected, whether it's the mayor's advisory council, whether it is the school board, or if it's, you know, the, um, the chamber, or the Kiwanis, or uh, the Boys and Girls Club, if it's an urban area. I'm talking to all those folks, because somebody in that area is connected. Somebody owns something. Somebody knows something. 